Welcome to The Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. Good evening and welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. So opening statements began in Trump's New York City trial yesterday with the prosecution arguing that this was election interference to make a hush money payment to uh, Stormy Daniels, the porn star, and uh, Donald Trump's team arguing that election interference is actually permissible if the underlying activity is not actually illegal. That's just an element of democracy. So how is this trial proceeding? Joining me now is Alan Dershowitz, who is Professor Emeritus of Harvard Law and a prolific writer. So Alan, uh, what do you make of the argument so far? Well, there's no crime here. I've been doing this 60 years. I've taught criminal law for 50 years at Harvard, written, I don't know, 30 books on criminal law, litigating. 250 cases. I've never seen a case like this. I don't think there's ever been a case like this in American history where a prosecutor just made up a crime. This prosecutor could have put Alexander Hamilton in prison uh, and probably Abraham Lincoln as well. Uh, it's just a made up crime. It starts with a state misdemeanor making a false entry in business records, which is barred by the statute of limitations. Then he magically tries to turn it into a state felony by saying the purpose was made a federal felony over which he has no jurisdiction and the federal government didn't prosecute. It's Alice in Wonderland. It's a fake made up crime. This judge should have dismissed. It. This judge has no idea what the First Amendment is about. He imposes prior restraint, prior restraint. That's what we fought a revolution to prevent, prior restraint on Donald Trump, it's telling him what he can say and what he can't say. And what he can't say is when a witness says, He's a terrible person. He can't say, yeah, but you're a terrible person, too. You know, it's not only his rights that are being denied. It's my rights and your rights. We're entitled to listen to the man who's running for president. I'm not a Trump political supporter, but I'm a supporter of the First Amendment and of due process. And this trial is a travesty of justice. That's why it should be on television, so that every American can see how their legal system is being distorted and weaponized for political purposes. But New terrified about putting this case on television because they're afraid that the people will see what a travesty this is. Yeah, and that's a really excellent point that regardless of your feelings of for or against Donald Trump, we all as Americans should be advocates for fairness in our process for a justice system that uh, requires due process, which is clearly not happening in this case. So let's um, dive a little bit deeper into th this judge's rationale for not just dismissing this. This seems like the easiest case ever for summary judgment. We shouldn't have even proceeded to trial. No, there's no summary judgment in civil case, in criminal cases, but you can make a motion to dismiss, which is the equivalent of uh, really either summary judgment or a motion to dismiss. It should have been granted. There is no crime here. I can't figure this out after being, you know, I probably have more experience in this than any person in the United States of America without bragging. And I'm 85 years old. I've been doing this for 60 years. There is nothing here. There is no crime. And yet, if you listen to CNN or you read the New York Times, this is the most serious crime since Abraham Lincoln's assassination, more serious than John Kennedy's assassination. And it's, it's like Abraham Lincoln's assassination as if it had been videotaped. The evidence is so clear. I mean, CNN is so totally distorting and misleading Americans for its own uh, partisan bias. Um, thankfully, there are some uh, media that are presenting this case uh, fairly. There's just nothing here. It's not a crime. Today, they're going to be putting on testimony by this guy, Pecker, uh, about uh, uh, what's it called? Catch and kill, as if it's a crime. Catch and kill is perfectly legal. Hush money, perfectly legal. Not disclosing hush money, perfectly legal. And yet, in, I don't know when we're ever going to get to what the criminal conduct is here, because there is none. Remember the old commercial, Where's the Beef? Where's the crime? It's just not here.
So what's the remedy when you have a kangaroo court like this that isn't willing to have a motion to dismiss uh, Grant One, or uh, it won't allow President Trump to voice his own opinions in the court of public opinion, which in an election year is almost just as valuable. He might even say it's more valuable than what's going on right now in the uh, the court of law, or and I put law, of course, in air quotes for this one. Well, I think that people like you and me should become involved in this, and there should be lawsuits brought on behalf of American citizens who want to hear from Donald Trump. I don't know if I want to vote for him, but I want to hear from him. I want to know what his views are. I want to be able to make up my mind. I have an open mind about who I'm going to vote for in the 2024 election, and the judge is preventing me from hearing from one of the candidates. First of all, by illegally making him stay in the courtroom, there is no right by prosecutors or by the court to make you be in the courtroom. The only right is the defendant's right. He has the right to be there if he wants to. He also has the right not to be there. He has the right to go to his son's graduation, to go hear the Supreme Court argument on immunity, or to go to the beach. Uh, he has no obligation to be there uh, unless he wants to be there. And the prosecution under New York law can simply unilaterally make him be there. They have to consent to a motion to waive that, too, is unconstitutional. If I were teaching constitutional law back at Harvard, assuming there was still a Harvard uh, with these demonstrations and they're going to even have classes, um, the, uh, I would be teaching this case as a, a role model of how not to conduct criminal trials in America. Yeah, it, it is an absolute travesty. And I hope that you do bring those lawsuits and you are successful. And we, we should talk more about that offline. But um, speaking of all of these protests, particularly at Columbia University, we only have about a minute and a half left. But um, you know, this raises some First Amendment questions. How do you see uh, these protests and the, the balance of rights here? Well, we're talking now about Hitler youth, about neo-Nazis who are calling for uh, praising rockets that are aimed at children calling for rapes. You have Columbia students advocating rape. Can you imagine if a Ku Klux Klan person came on campus and said, I urge you to rape black women? You, you think the university would tolerate that? Columbia is a private university. It can set up its own rules. It has set up discriminatory rules. There's one rule for blacks and Arabs and minorities, uh, sexual minorities, transgenders on the one hand, and another rule for Jews, uh, you can't have that double standard under free speech, under the First Amendment. You have to have one standard applicable to all, and Columbia is violating that standard. They are encouraging rape. They are encouraging yeah. murder. They are encouraging unsafe spaces. These are the same students, these snowflake marshmallow students, who demand a safe yeah. space for themselves. But no and, and Alan, we got to leave it there, but really well said. Appreciate your insights. We'll be right back with more. Throughout history, there are clear moments that define our nation's path. And now you can own a piece of that history. I'm thrilled to announce the official Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin from our friends at Legacy Precious Metals in partnership with Speaker Gingrich. This limited edition, one ounce, 99.99% silver coin commemorates the historic victory in 1994 when the Republican Party, under Speaker Gingrich's guidance, took control of Congress. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin also symbolizes the transformative political platform that led to the landmark achievements like the overhaul of the U.S. welfare system and the Balanced Budget Act. This is a limited edition coin that will sell out. So whether you're looking for the perfect gift or you want to own a piece of history, act fast before they run out. The Newt Gingrich contract with America coin is more than an investment. It's a tribute to honest government and America. You can order it online at NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com. That's NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com and use promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, to get $10 off your purchase. Go to NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com now. Well, at least one writer is comparing the Trump trial in New York City to a Soviet show trial. This headline coming from The Blaze, Trump's New York ordeal echoes sinister Soviet show trials. 
It's funny in a mordant way that Alvin Bragg upgraded Trump's charges to felonies. He downgraded 60% of felony cases to lesser charges in 2023. Jim Nels is a writer, political analyst, and author of this piece in The Blaze and joins me now. So Jim, um, I mean, there are so many hypocrisies in this, including that Alvin Bragg's opening statement, uh, the prosecution's opening statement, is claiming that this case is all about election interference. Um, I don't see any of them at risk of losing their licenses or being, uh, you know, the, the threats to democracy and so forth. Um, so what really is the purpose of this trial? And are we going to see any modicum of fairness? So Alvin Bragg is right. It is about election interference, but it's election interference because it prevents people from getting to vote for the candidate of their choice on the Republican side of the ticket. Um, Donald Trump is not being allowed to campaign right now. He's stuck in a New York City uh, a trial, and he can't go and do the things that he needs to do to become um, reelected, basically, for the third time. Uh, what, what Alvin Bragg is doing is a disgusting, disgusting thing. He, again, he upgraded a misdemeanor charge that literally would never have been brought to any other, any other person, and he upgraded that to a felony, even though, like you said in the opening, he downgraded 60% of felonies to misdemeanors during 2023. So this is a joke. This is a show trial. And this is election interference trying to prevent Donald Trump from winning the next election. So it's 2024 election interference, basically, rather than uh, Bragg suggesting that it's it was 2016 election interference. And it's interesting, the timing of this, of course, because uh, you know, the DOJ declined to prosecute this case already, and then nothing was happening until Trump decided to uh, announce that he's running for re-election in November of 2024. And so clearly this is a uh, political lawfare. And yet we see that with the jury being impaneled, it was a little bit surprising to me that it only took a week, especially in one of the most blue counties in the country. Uh, what we've seen from some of the interviews of the jurors who have been dismissed, and there was one in particular who actually got through the initial questionnaire uh, saying that she could be biased, but then all of her statements to reporters after the fact were anything but uh, fair. So are we going to see this case just proceed to conviction and hope that it's overturned on appeal? Or what in, in your mind, as, as someone who's just watching this unfold, what's the comparison to a Soviet show trial? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but my, my hypothesis is that he will be convicted um, and then it'll be overturned by the Supreme Court. Um, hopefully the Supreme Court this week or whenever they hear the case will overturn uh, the ruling that he cannot be held accountable for anything he did as a president, just like judges can't be held accountable or Congress people cannot be held accountable. And so we need to do that for, for President Trump. But this trial will again result in a conviction and then it'll be overturned by the Supreme Court. And let's talk for a second about the hypocrisy of uh, the gag order as well, because um, you know I, I don't think that the gag order itself is necessarily unconstitutional, especially when you have such high profile cases, but the fact that it's only imposed against Donald Trump, and yet all of these witnesses, including Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, um, you know, who have very serious issues of credibility, obviously are free to say, you know, whatever they want, and there's no a gag order against Trump's uh, political opposition, much less uh, the legal opposition that he faces. I think this is one of the things that frustrates common sense Americans, and we see the two tiers of justice being applied even procedurally. No, I, I thought gag orders were to prevent the defendant from being prosecuted by the prosecutors during the trial when they could speak outside of the, uh, of the, of the courthouse. But now they're telling Trump that he can't speak about anything and I think it's outrageous. A man should have the ability, or a woman, have, should have the ability to defend themselves in the public square, get up on that, 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 that soapbox, if you will, and talk about what's happening to them. And they've taken that away from President Trump. And, but again, I think the American people are seeing this for what it is, and this is going to do nothing but help President Trump. He may be the first president to win an election from a jail cell, which I think would be amazing. And the other thing is, Jenna, can you imagine if they put him in jail for contempt and he comes out of jail with his dress shirt, with the sleeves cut off, 
He's got a new uh, teardrop tattoo under his left eye because he shanked an MS-13 member to death in the shower. This is nothing but good for Trump. <laughs> well, let's hope it doesn't reach uh, that level of, uh, you know, the the apprentice level television reality uh, show. But, you know, but it is absolutely ridiculous that we're even contemplating um, a possibility of contempt when you have a gag order that you know, traditionally the purpose of that is to ensure that you don't affect the jury pool. Well, the, the jury pool has the jury has now been selected. And, and again, it was only against uh, President Trump. And I think that the judge in this case knows that this is a lot more about the court of public opinion than it actually is the court of law. This is a, a, a political prosecution that's seeking legal justification. And so here, while the trial is ongoing, um, there's a gag order just against Donald Trump when he already, as you mentioned, Jim, can't campaign uh, during the potentially six to eight weeks that this trial is unfolding. And um, and even more than that, his own advisors and his own legal team are also prevented from comments uh, subject to contempt of court. And so, you know, this just th th this really does smack of unfairness. But you mentioned that this probably will actually work to Trump's favor. Um, what do you see the the politics of this? How do you see this unfolding if this is just the first of several trials and times in the defendant's chair that Trump is going to have to endure before November? Well, I think the number one thing this does actually is with the African-American community in America. They look at themselves as being prosecuted and they see Donald Trump being prosecuted and they're like, damn, I want to be with this guy because he's going through the same thing we are. Look at all the rappers who are coming out in favor of Trump at this point, right? I mean, Trump should change his theme song away from uh, proud to be an American to gangster's paradise because so many rappers and African-Americans are coming out for him right now. So this is helping them in that community. And I wanna go back to this judge. This judge is a joke. He should be disqualified. He should have recused himself. I can't believe he did not do it. He, he donated to Joe Biden. His daughter has raised over $100 million for Democrats based off of this trial, and yet he won't recuse himself. It is insane. But again, it's a pure layup for Trump on his um, appeal when it goes to the Supreme Court. Well, Jim Nell's great piece in The Blaze. Thanks so much for stopping by. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. Well, friends, you might have heard that Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way that they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture, so they want to pass along the savings directly to you by having a $25 extravaganza. I love that word, extravaganza. <laughs> when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company. With the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some you may not even know about. To get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza extravaganza. Two pack multi use my pillows are just $25. My pillow sandals also awesome. Only $25. Their six pack towel sets are $25 and brand new four pack dish towels. You guessed it, just $25. For the first time ever, the premium my pillows with the all new Giza fabric, just $25 and orders over $75 will receive free shipping too. This amazing offer won't last long. Go to mypillow.com, use the promo code Jenna or call 800-564- 8475 today. That's 800 564 8475, or go to mypillow.com and use the promo code Jenna. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, Democrats are pushing even harder for ballot initiatives ahead of November to uh, roll back pro-life wins in states even like Florida. So Ballotpedia says this about Florida's Amendment 4, uh, which is titled the Right to Abortion Initiative. What would the initiative do? The initiative would provide a constitutional right to abortion before fetal viability estimated to be around 24 weeks or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined 
by the patient's health care provider. The initiative would not change the state legislature's authority to enact a law requiring the parents of a minor to be notified if their child is seeking an abortion with exceptions that can be attained through a judicial waiver. Notice that term notified. So a reporter challenged Governor DeSantis earlier this week saying, well, this doesn't change uh, the right of parents to have to provide consent. And he said, no, no, no. Consent is very different than just notice, which can happen after the fact. Listen to this. I appreciate it, sir, that on, regarding Amendment 4, the, the, the measure reads this amendment does not require the, the, the change of parental notification. And so a, That's not consent, exactly. You so, made the point. How, how deceptive is a, that? A parent needs to provide a notarized letter to the physician. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. But, it, so, but that is the law, right? And that will remain the law. No, that will trump Florida state law on that. They're doing that. There's a difference between consent and notification. Notification is after the fact. Uh, The consent is obviously a condition precedent. They did that because they know going after parents' rights is a vulnerability. And they tested this with millions of dollars to try to get people. So they did that. Now, uh, don't be fooled, though. That is severing the parental consent for minors. It does it because it's written so broadly to just take out the notification, which is different than consent, uh, is not going to cut it. So, so I think people that look at that um, and, and really understand what's at play here will do it. But here's what I would also tell Floridians. When these things get on the ballot, if it's confusing to you, you're talking about amending the Constitution. This is not something that can just be changed willy-nilly. Uh, if they're confusing you, if there's something, if they're not defining these terms and they don't define those terms, just vote no on it. And that's on any subject matter. If they can't provide you something that's clear and concise where you know 100 percent of how this thing is going to done, then, then it's not something that's worth putting into the Constitution. And that's one of the things like, you know, we looked at this marijuana The marijuana one is written so broadly, you are not going to be able to restrict where people use it. Uh, And and it's going to cause and and there's because I think there's some voters that 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 really, you know, use it and they like it, whatever. There's most voters do not use it, but there's some that are like, look, Walker Wildman is the vice president at the American Family Association, where I host Jenna Ellis in the morning from 8 to 9 Eastern. You can tune in at AFR.net. Walker, uh, Governor DeSantis raises an excellent point that the left is purposefully trying to be vague in their language of these amendments to, I think, manipulate the voters. Yeah, I think uh, Governor DeSantis needs to be appointed national spokesperson for the Republican National uh, (laughs) Committee, convention, party, whatever you want to call it. Uh, because instead of saying go with your heart or we're going to peel back uh, the uh, pro-life position in Arizona, instead he articulates the major red flags with these constitutional ballot initiatives that are being passed all around the country. The left is beating us on this issue, and we have to win in Florida on this Amendment 4, this Initiative 4. This is a big big deal. And these ballot initiatives are being written so broadly to the governor's point there that they, that after the fact, after these uh, come uh, uh, to law to uh, uh, amendment uh, uh, status, uh, if they are passed, I guess you could say, uh, they can be uh, maneuvered and, 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 and really diverted to do way more than people think that they're going to the ballot box to do. So we have to defeat these ballot initiatives on the abortion issue. This is a very dangerous path that we're on. It's not pro-woman. It's not pro-baby. It's very, very dangerous. And, and, and this has to be defeated. So I'm hoping, I'm optimistic that Florida is going to be a turning point on this issue, that we can defeat this in Florida and begin to defeat these efforts around the country as well. I'm hopeful as well, and I think uh, you're right that Governor DeSantis is uh, being a very bold advocate on this, and he's not uh, shrinking back and saying, oh, you know, well, we'll just let the voters decide, to your point, you know, follow your heart, um, because this is also anti-parent. Um, you know, th- this is something that is trying purposefully to change the composition of uh, of the state by especially going around uh, the, the legislature and seeking to codify this and ratify this as a constitutional amendment so that there can't be things in the future.
teacher like heartbeat bills, for example. Um, and he's even talking about things as dangerous as, as marijuana uh, amendments as well. Um, so how do you think that conservatives need to message this to get this point across about how dangerous this language is? This isn't pro-women or pro-parent or pro-baby. This is very dangerous, um, especially because it's so vague. Yeah, I think we need to message this uh, really to go after two critical issues. Number one, amendments like this and that have passed in Kansas and other places, unfortunately, they take away the rights of the baby. We can't forget about this. There's a baby in the womb with a heartbeat, with a life beginning at conception. And when you pass these overly broad pro-abortion, pro-death amendments, you're taking away the constitutional rights that every child in the womb has. That's point number one. Point number two is the left, no, they, they do not know how to stop. The, the left does not know boundaries. They will push this farther. Should they win on these ballot amendment issues around the country and continue to win, they're going to immediately pivot to the transgender issue. And they're going to be passing amendments stating that minors without parental consent can get these gender altering, body altering surgeries without their parents' consent with just the consent of the government or some rogue doctor. Uh, so the left knows no bounds here. They're going after our children. They're starting with babies, but they will pivot this as soon as, as next year, they will pivot this to the transgender issue and make it to where 13 year olds are having their bodies altered in the guise of gender affirming care against the will of the parents. Yeah, the left doesn't have any limiting principles at all. And we're going to get into a Title IX in the Biden administration that's already signaling how they're trying to push the transgender agenda further and uh, foreclose parental rights because it's all about uh, the so-called you know, rights of uh, of the the world that children belong to our community rather than children belonging to parents. Um, this is really, really dangerous rhetoric. Um, but to also to Governor DeSantis's point, if the language is so vague that you're not really sure what it is, just vote no, even if it's a good thing, then somebody will come back later with more precise language. We need precision in the law. So we'll be right back with more with Walker Wildman on Title IX when we come back on Jenna Ellis tonight. Throughout history, there are clear moments that define our nation's path, and now you can own a piece of that history. I'm thrilled to announce the official Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin from our friends at Legacy Precious Metals in partnership with Speaker Gingrich. This limited edition, one ounce, 99.99% silver coin commemorates the historic victory in 1994 when the Republican Party, under Speaker Gingrich's guidance, took control of Congress. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin also symbolizes the transformative political platform that led to the landmark achievements like the overhaul of the U.S. welfare system and the Balanced Budget Act. This is a limited edition coin that will sell out. So whether you're looking for the perfect gift or you want to own a piece of history, act fast before they run out. The Newt Gingrich contract with America Coin is more than an investment. It's a tribute to honest government and America. You can order it online at NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com. That's NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com and use promo code Jenna, that's J-E-N-N-A, to get $10 off your purchase. Go to NewtGingrichSilverCoin.com now. I'm continuing my conversation with Walker Wildman, who is the vice president for the American Family Association, where I host Jenna Ellis in the morning at AFR.net. You can find the podcast and the replay there. And Walker, um, to your point in the last segment, I mean, the Biden administration and the left is signaling so clearly that this is all about pushing their radical leftist agenda with the LGBTQ uh, agenda. And they're not at all interested in women's rights, protecting women. And yet they kind of have cornered the messaging market on saying that they are the party of pro-women and it's uh, the Republicans and the conservatives that are antiquated and we're all about the patriarchy and wanting to put women back in the kitchen, you know, barefoot. I mean, it's such ridiculous hyperbole. And Megyn Kelly was on Glenn Beck's show uh, the other day and had, I think, a really good response to this. Listen to this and I wanna get your comments. While we were focused on other things, they were taking over legislation in 50 states and at the federal level when it comes to so-called trans rights. Yeah. And whenever you hear that term, you should remind yourself it means at the erasure of women. 
at, at the expense of women's rights. The, I was looking on Friday when Title IX, with the revisions came out, you know, where are the women's groups? Where are they to say this is too much? We are not redefining women and we're not allowing so-called trans women, which is a completely made up thing. There's no such thing as a trans woman. It's a man pretending to be a woman. That's what it is. Uh, into our bathrooms and our locker rooms, in our grade schools, in our colleges where women don't want to share their locker room with some random man who claims he's a woman. Have you seen some of the videos on the Internet of the men who, who t- exploit no. this provision? It's not all lovely, genuinely confused men who really want to pass as women. The vast majority of the time, it's either someone who's a pervert who's exploiting it because he gets off on seeing women in the half dressed, or it's somebody who's called an autogynophile who gets sexually aroused by wearing women's clothing. Why does he have the right to come into my daughter's bathroom? Great question. Walker, your thoughts? Oh, gosh, I can't believe we were having to discuss this, but she's right. She she stated, Megyn Kelly stated the obvious and what we all talk about, but does it make the airwaves because the media always censors it? Uh, but this is sick stuff. I mean, these are sick people, and we ought not be catering to it. I mean, this this complete rewriting of Title IX is, like, not rooted in anything, not only in science and reality, but also not rooted in the law. To say that those uh, that, that that our congressmen and congresswomen and the president who signed the, the bill uh, addressing civil rights, specifically Title IX deals with, deals with education, to state that those lawmakers at the time weren't really sure what a woman was and weren't really sure what a man was, and they thought that possibly you could swap back and forth between male and female from a biology standpoint. To say that they thought that or they left that open-ended is completely nonsense. There is zero evidence to support that. Male is male, female is female, and the bureaucratic agencies shouldn't be able to rewrite the law. That's unconstitutional. It's illegal. It's a farce. This this rulemaking is gotten out of control. And that's why should President Trump get back in there or whoever gets in there post Biden uh, has to completely demolish these bureaucratic agencies because the federal rulemaking is rogue and it's a threat to our constitution. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's undermining the rule of law and undermining democracy. And, you know, again, the, the Democrats would like to corner the market on messaging and say, hey, we're pro-democracy, will of the people, when they're the ones who are writing these rules that nobody has a say and, uh, and are just uh, foisting them on the rest of the country. But to, to your point earlier in the last segment um, as well, Walker, with the vagueness that is in so many of these rules, that's apparent as well in this Title IX rewriting, because the entire point of the leftist LGBTQ agenda is that gender is vague. There's no way to actually specifically biologically determine what gender you are, and it's all on a spectrum. So they live in this realm of vagueness so that they can manipulate the law and the rules however they see fit, give the pass to the dude in the bathroom, but then they can go after Christian conservatives who uh, maybe are standing outside of an abortion clinic. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and our side also has to be very clear and consistent and concise on this issue. And unfortunately, uh, one of President Trump's nominees to the Supreme Court, now a justice, Gorsuch, he got it completely wrong on this very issue when it comes to the Bostic opinion. That had to deal with another title, another civil rights statute, but very same issue at hand. It had to do with the workplace instead. And what Gorsuch ruled and what he wrote and the effects of that terrible Bostic opinion from a couple of years ago was he stated that, yeah, a dude can cross dress at work. It had to deal with a funeral home and an employee there. And so Gorsuch said, yeah, this this dude can 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 cross dress under the guise of civil rights protection. And that's quite OK. That's not what the law was intended for. The law was intended for sex ba- to, to prevent sex based discrimination, meaning not hiring females simply because they're females, but not to be perverted uh, for this sexual deviancy agenda. So this stuff has to be fought back. We have to defeat this not only in the media, but also in the courts and in the legislature. And we have to stop the bureaucrats from rewriting laws that were written 50 years ago and rewriting them to mean something that they were completely not intended for. 
Yeah, and that's such a great example of the Bostock decision of taking that term sex out of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and reinventing it into a vague term that can mean whatever the left wants it to mean. So not only are they creating their own vagaries in legal language, but they're actually trying to take very precise language from 1964 and prior uh, to mean whatever they want it to mean in today's society. And that was a terrible decision. And hopefully there will be uh, some Supreme Court cases that will give maybe Justice Gorsuch and the majority some opportunities to clarify that or maybe even overturn it because we're seeing how terrible the consequences are. Um, So for AFA action in just the last about minute I have with you, uh, Walker Wildman, where uh, specifically are you focused uh, for AFA action in some of these ballot initiatives Um, that are protecting women's rights. Yeah, we're fighting back against these. We're going to put a heavy focus on Florida. That's really going to be our prime opportunity to turn this around because how red Florida has turned. So I think we can use Florida to shift momentum. But overall, we want to really shape the messaging on this and tether the parental rights movement of Loudoun County that really took steam in 2020, 2021, et cetera. And we want to pivot that and tether it to the abortion issue and the issue of, of women's rights and, and debunking this transgender myth. We've got we to tether all of these issues together into one major issue, and that is taking America back to a path of sanity. And that's what we're going to work on. Amen to that. We really do need to return to sanity. And I hope that Florida is a beacon of that. And Governor DeSantis uh, really should be the messenger of that, uh, as you very well articulated, uh, Walker Wildman, because um, he's standing so boldly like conservatives should do. We'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis tonight. As Republicans are still deeply divided over the aid packages that were passed out of the House and then sent all together those four proposals to the Senate that funded Ukraine and also uh, Taiwan, Israel, and also the humanitarian aid that really will go to Gaza, uh, how should we as conservatives view uh, the aid to Israel, specifically the conflict in the Middle East, and also Speaker Mike Johnson? Well, here to break it all down for us is Gino Geraci, who is a Salem radio host out of Denver and also the pastor of Grace Bible Church in Longmont. So, Gino, thanks so much. And um, as you were saying in the break, this is a complex issue. Uh, How do you want to break this down? Well, I think it's a twofold breakdown. The the, the way that I think I want to break it down is both from from a practical standpoint, a political practical standpoint, and from a biblical standpoint. And I think that the practical, practical standpoint is even if there was no biblical interest in how we respond to Israel, um, Israel is our our neighbor in the Middle East. Israel does share our values, our commitments, our vision of what free people should look like in a in a free society. Um, but what makes this very politically complex is by aggregating the aid to Ukraine and then ultimately Gaza, we quite literally muddy the waters. Obviously, uh, thoughtful people probably should have said, hey, look, if we're going to have a coherent foreign policy, let's try and come up with a coherent foreign policy. And that's the challenge that both the lawmakers and then we as conservatives face Uh, because there seems to be an unending stream of incompetence at at the political level. (laughs) Yeah, really well said. And Speaker Johnson is, I think, rightly getting a lot of criticism for failing to meet his uh, six-month promise to secure America's border first before sending any uh, foreign aid, even to place... I mean, I agree, we need to send aid to Israel, but not before and certainly not instead of securing our border. So how do you view uh, that criticism? And particularly because he's a, he is a Christian and he, he espouses to have the biblical worldview. Um, and, and so what, what do we make of that? You know, again, it's a complex issue, but if we ask and answer the question, what is government's fundamental responsibility? And that is, in my view, to promote righteousness and prevent wickedness, and so uh, also to secure the the borders and to make sure that the citizens are safe. 
And so, again, if you fail on that fundamental issue, then, uh, again, I'm not saying that we leave um, Taiwan or even Israel to fend for itself. But again, there is something fundamentally wrong and fundamentally broken with a government that has failed to act constitutionally in the protection of its own citizens. So that's a, that's a, that's a real problem. It is. And, and I, you know, I think Mike Johnson would have been the first to say when he was sitting on the House Judiciary Committee for seven years, when he was a member, uh, just a member of the U.S. Congress, not the speaker, that uh, the Constitution has to drive the uh, the policy decision making. And even more fundamentally than that, the biblical worldview, uh, which, as you rightly described, you know, is the legitimacy of government and what their limited powers are. Uh, are and the purpose for which they are used. And it's not a, a legitimate function of government to simply take all of the tax dollars from American citizens and beyond that and put us further in debt to go fund uh, other countries without fundamentally securing the rights of our own citizens. And so that conflict um, t to me is really a, a remarkable variation from what Speaker Johnson has previously professed. And there was an article in uh, toddstarns.com today that said that um, <laughs> that Speaker Johnson, he asked Hakeem Jeffries uh, what to do. And then he also asked God as a matter of prayer, what to do. And this was the response. And I just think that that's a um, that's an appeal to authority fallacy to say, well, God told me to do it this way. Therefore, don't question it. And again, think about what you just said about a logical fallacy. And I think that this is part of what's happening, too, is, and again, I'm trying to think the best and the highest about P Speaker Johnson, just like you. I mean, I like him. Um, I like mm -hmm. his conservative views. He has traditionally done such a great job. But I think, again, what is happening is it's a kicking of the can down the road. It is a paralysis that's taking place. It is a weakness in in our in our government that we try to fix what we think we can fix, but the other thing looks unresolvable and unsolvable. And so I think that the speaker is going, you know, it's it's that horrible, terrible thing. Well, we've got to do something. And and imagine where you you come to the conclusion that you have to do something even if that something is wrong. Yeah, and and I think that um, that urge to just do something rather than saying, no, we're going to restrain ourselves or we're going to balance um, the legitimacy of government with the interests that aren't legitimate functions that we don't have the power to do, or even uh, to balance the interests of what you can do with things that you shouldn't. I mean, those are all uh, philosophical questions of the legitimacy of government. And so, so how do you see the conservative movement uh, moving forward, you know, if we have, you know, two people who have been in two of the most powerful offices in the United States um, in the last, you know, maybe 40 years since Reagan, you have, you know, Mike Pence, um, who is vice president, you have Speaker Johnson, um, who are evangelical Christians, and yet they fundamentally failed. I mean, with the COVID response, and then now Mike Johnson was securing our border. Uh, what does this say about maybe the church failing to engage civil society? Well, and again, I think that that's part of the challenge. Is it the church's failure to engage the society? Because again, when the church does engage the society and says, hey, you know what, we're going to vote for a pro-life candidate. Hey, you know what, we're going to vote for a candidate candidate who has, who shares our values, who, 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 who we think embrace our virtues, and then they fail to... Um, they fail to follow through because, again, the quagmire that is taking place in the desperate worldviews that are unfolding. And that see, this goes back to the other thing that I was going to try to hint at, and that is both there's this – it's this idea that we're going to find a political solution. And then you have mm -hmm. the spiritual aspect or the biblical aspect of Israel and – you know, the and, whole issue. And we got to leave it there, Passover. Gino, but this is a much more <laughs> complex issue, of course, and we're already out of time for Jenna Ellis tonight, but we'll be back uh, tomorrow with more to talk about all these things on the Salem News Channel.